After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. And different uh, names are given for it in history and even in the scripture. And on this wise showed him he himself. So this is a story of the third time he appears to the disciples after his resurrection. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. Amen. I like that. I don't like the next part, though, because this scripture is fulfilled. This day, this scripture is fulfilled just about every time I go fishing. They send him, we also go with thee. They went forth, entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. What a beautiful picture when you think about Peter and his denial of Christ in that twilight hour uh, and where that cock was crowing. And now, in a new morning, a new dawning, uh, here Christ is appearing to them once again. And he's, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, Okay, John, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. So now they're participating in it. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes and 153. And for all there were so many, yet was not the, the net broken. And Jesus said to them, come and dine. Just remember that phrase, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. Amen. You can take your seats. I have a, um, uh, a unique sermon today. And uh, if, but John, if you don't mind, maybe just show that I have a menu prepared for you today. And this is kind of the title. Um, so the title today, and we'll come back to it, is Red Herring or Rainbow Trout. And, and so I put together a little bit of a menu just to kind of get you thinking about this. And I, in the outset, I wanted to say that I have a very heavy pastoral burden that I'd like to deliver. And uh, I want you to make it personal, but don't take it personal. Does that make sense? Uh, make it personal, but don't take it personal, because I do not have any person in mind, but I do desire that each, one, each person would examine themselves, their individual focus, make the word relevant, relevant for themselves, speaking some European there. Uh, just make it relevant for where you are, and if it seems, I, I don't have any particular situation in mind, so it's not like I'm trying to address anything, I just have a burden, and when, there, when the burden comes, you realize, well, this must mean something for the people, if it comes this heavy and this clear, then it must have some relevance, and so uh, come with your rake today, and not your pitchfork, bring it into yourselves, make it personal, but nothing I'm saying is directed to anybody in particular, any particular situation, though there's maybe some things I could think of not necessarily related here, but outwardly that the bride is facing in different voices and things that are in the land, and so I'm wanting you to uh, uh, make it personal, but don't take it personal, and bear with me as I deliver this pastoral burden. And the title, if you need the title now, it's Red Herring or Rainbow Trout. It's presented to you in this context of a menu. And if you can read it, whole pickled and smoked net caught herring is the red herring. Or Rainbow Trout, fire grilled, fresh line caught rainbow trout. So those are your two choices. Uh, I guess they're served without sauce and sides. And I couldn't think of any spiritual desserts or appetizers that I wanted to mix into the metaphors. So I'm just leaving it at this. Red herring or rainbow trout today. And you can consider that and ponder it. I wanted to say, Brother Chris, I appreciated the, the idea of ponder points because I heard amongst the young people there was this little thing where they're trying to count how many times they say ponder in a service. And I was like, I can go two ways with this. I can say it so many times I get sick of it, or I can not say it at all for a couple months. I'm like, what happened? And so I don't think I've said it at all for two or three months, but I'm going to go ahead and work it back in. 
Because the concept of a ponder point, I thought it was wonderful the way Brother Chris put it. He says, when you, it's a point that you ponder. You don't maybe fully get it at that moment, but you consider. You keep these things, and you, you wonder about it, and you kind of turn it over. And so there, I think God does that often with the Word. He wants us to think about it. He wants us to ponder it. He wants us to absorb it. And so we'll have some ponder points today. Maybe that's my subtitle, Pondering, pondering Fish. There's a pun in there. So John chapter 21, verse 9, I want to read this quote, uh, this scripture again and start off. This will help me kind of get kind of get moving a little bit. And so as the disciples came to land, um, dragging these nets, uh, fish are going to be pulled behind them. They come to land. It says there's Jesus in the morning time and they saw a fire of coals there. So Jesus had made a fire and on the fire already fish that had they had not caught. But fish was already being cooked. Fish laid thereon in bread. And so Jesus is cooking fish for them. And it's already prepared. And he says to them, come and dine. Come and eat. I've prepared fish. I have bread. I've, I've, made, you, I've made you this meal. Come and eat. And so fish would have been a staple food. It still is a staple food in many different countries and regions. It was a staple food at the time in this ancient times. Very important commodity and industry in that time. So there's a lot of ways that you see fish come up in the Old Testament and New Testament. In my research, I found that there's no particular species or fish that's given a name, but you see it mentioned quite often. And the subject of fish and fishing occurs uh, frequently in Christ's own ministry. When we see him calling the disciples, he called them from their nets. As a matter of fact, I believe seven of 12 disciples were actually fishermen. And he spoke from uh, fishing boats. He traveled in fishing boats. He fed the multitudes twice, thousands of people multiplying fish and bread. And even when a tax was due, he found, he said, go and uh, he caught a fish and the tax tribute was found in a fish's mouth. And so uh, the fish is, you know, finds itself quite often. There's some that have done very deep studies on the, the particular number of 153. And some say that's how many species of fish were known at the time. And they use, uh, you know, mathematics, a lot of different things to bring in a lot of uh, kind of neat types and shadows with respect to even the numbers and the fish itself. But with but this particular instance, here's Christ cooking fish, and the very first, one of the first, at the very beginning of his ministry, one of his miracles in Luke chapter 5, was a cast your net and bringing in the, a, a huge catch for Peter. And so it began with this miracle. At the beginning, there was a miracle of the fish, and then here in John chapter 21, in his third appearance to the disciples after his resurrection, it happens again, and now he's cooking this fish upon the fire. And have you heard of St. Peter's fish? It's tilapia, and I think it has a special place in a Catholic's heart. And um, there's a, uh, and for this tilapia, they say this is probably what they would have caught in the Sea of Galilee at the time. So some think the fish Peter was catching, and even the fish that maybe Jesus was preparing, uh, was this um, tilapia. I don't know that there's any rainbow trout in the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's not listed as a species, but there's, all, there's herring in the Sea of Galilee. And so my title is Red Herring. A rainbow trout. It's a choice between two fishes, and one is maybe just the species in general, the rainbow trout, uh, but then the red herring is actually cooked herring, and we'll touch on that here in a moment. And if you're not thinking already a lot and, and mulling over this ponder point of red herring or rainbow trout, you may be getting hungry, but lunch is coming. I want to start with a statement from the sermon, what is a vision? And you remember the vision, we call it the tent vision, uh, the third pull vision, and it was this uh, this vision that has these three different parts to it and unfolds one to the next. The one that gets the, the most attention is the one of the cathedral-like tent in that little room. We've been studying on that lately and studying a lot of different thoughts on that little room and some different things God's been quickening to me. But I want to read this lengthy statement from what is a vision because Brother Ram's talking about, it's all about this third pool and he's referred and you take from other instances where he gives each one of these parts of the lacing the shoe the fishing and the tent he's just told the story about lacing the, sh the little baby booty and he says you're threatening the wrong end and he says and as I started to reach down I was gone again and then when I came to I was standing by the side of a beautiful lake something like your lake out here in the summertime and he's in Chicago when it's uh, real pretty and green and there were fishermen all around the lake and they were fishing but they were catching small fishes and I looked out in the lake and those great, beautiful rainbow trout out there. So it's, it's looking at these beautiful, big rainbow trout. And I said, I know this is a vision, but I can't understand those trout. But I said, you know, I believe right down in my heart I can catch those. So I picked up the string, but instead of it being a string, it was a fishing pole. 
And just then the one behind me said, now I'll teach you to fish how to catch those. And he said, tie on the lure. And I snapped the lure on. He said, now throw way out. The other one says, now listen close, way out into the deep. He said, when you do now, let the lure sink down first. And then said, pull it slow. Now that's really fisherman's technique. He said, then when you do, now you'll feel some nibbles at it, but don't tell nobody what you're doing. Keep it to yourself. And said, then you'll feel it nibble again and just pull a little bit, but not too hard. And you realize the continuity of some other parts of the vision. It won't be a public show. And you tried to, you can't teach Pentecostal babies supernatural things is kind of the emphasis in that first stage of the, um, the vision. Uh, I heard a minister say one time, and I, this, this, real, this will make you think. He said, if you could teach it, it uh, if you can teach it to a Pentecostal baby, it's not supernatural. And I thought. Okay, That's, that'll make you think. He says you can't teach uh, Pentecostal babies supernatural things. And so it, it, there's kind of that theme where don't tell anybody, keep it a secret. You know, he's building on that idea of the third pull. He said, and then it'll pull it away from the little fish. And when they scatter, that'll attract the attention of the big fish and they'll grab it. So there's something being represented in this attraction or this pull. And he says, and, and said, that's the way you'll catch it. Said, then when they bite on the third time, Set your hook for the catch. And I believe it's in another place where Brother Bram says the third pull, I think it's in the seventh seal, he says the third pull will get the big fish. So when he, when he talks about this rainbow trout, and this is how I'm using the rainbow trout as a symbol of something, to refer to something. I'm using it to refer to the third pull and what it means to you personally. And whether you want to say you're the, you're the rainbow trout that was caught by that third pull or it has some sort of symbolism within the word of God itself, um, the third pull is what gets those great beautiful rainbow trout out there. Brother Bram, when he tells the vision, he talks about how he jerked it too soon. And he, the, it looked like the lure came out of the water and he did catch something, but it just skinned over the lure and he didn't really catch the fish. And again, he was very discouraged. That's when he's taken to the cathedral and God's trying to show him something very particular about the third pool. But for me, I'm wanting to look at this. When I say rainbow trout, when I, when I give you the choice, red hair and a rainbow trout, I'm using rainbow trout as just a phrase to refer to the third pool and all it means to you. And your relationship to it. Brother Branham and the anointed ones at the end time. He said the third pull, the opening of the word, the mysteries revealed. The third pull was the opening of the seven seals to reveal the hidden truth that's been sealed in the word. So the third pull is the opening of the word. The third pull is the opening of the seven seals. Brother Branham not speaking even in future tense, but present tense, even past tense, that the third pull is at hand. It is the opening of the word. It reveals mysteries that were sealed in the word. So when I say rainbow trout, think of the third pull. Think of the opening of the word. Now for red herring. You say you're going out of order on your title. It was necessary just to establish that. Now with respect to red herring. How many have heard of a herring? Herring is a type of fish. It's a small fish found in large schools. It looks like an anchovy, but a little bit larger. And a red herring, there's no species or type of fish called red herring, but red herring is a dried smoked herring that kind of turns reddish brown when it's cured through the smoking process. It's very fishy, very smelly, a very pungent smelling. I don't know why I said fishy like Donald Trump, but it is. It's a fishy smell and a very fishy, people tell me, uh, but it's a pungent fish. It's very fishy. And the concept of red herring, the phrase of red herring, it is a fish that you eat. And they can go back as far as 1420s uh, to find a reference to red herring and herring that had been cooked through this particular process. I had pictures to show. I don't know how I didn't make it into the slideshow. I realized this morning I left all my beautiful pictures of smoked herring uh, in the folder. And I apologize for that. We can, we can do a slideshow later. We could just do an afternoon session on fish. But uh, in... In 1686, there was a weekly periodical, uh, it's called the Weekly Political Register. Excuse me, actually, it was in 1686 that a British magazine, uh, and I think it was a gentleman's magazine, that suggested that to train horses to follow hounds, you could use uh, a dead animal, dead fox or dead cat or something like that, to, that the hounds would chase, and you're going to teach the horses to follow the hounds. And this particular writer said, and if there's no cat available or dead, dead hound available, then a red herring will suffice. I think it was kind of used jokingly like, hey, this fish stinks. It smells. Um, so if you can't find a dead animal, use a red herring. The hounds will chase it and you can train your horses. 
Uh, but a couple hundred years later, almost in 1807, there was a political weekly political magazine that used the term red herring. How many have heard the phrase red herring before? All of you should have raised your hand because I've used it at least a dozen times already this morning. Uh, but so the red herring uh, was used in this particular story. And the, the gentleman writing it, William Corbett, I believe is his name. He was telling a story of a boy who used a red herring as a decoy uh, to distract hounds who were trying to chase a fox. So it was a young boy who had a heart for foxes. The hounds were chasing it and he used a red herring to kind of distract them and draw them off the trail. These hounds are fox hounds. They want to catch a fox. And he used this smelly fish to kind of detour them and turn them away. And so this writer used the red. The story as a metaphor of how the press, and he used it to criticize the press because they'd kind of followed some misleading information about Napoleon's, uh, the defeat of Napoleon. And the press was enamored with it, and it was getting all this attention. And it kind of distracted them, and this particular writer said it distracted them from important domestic matters. And this is the phrase he used. It was a mere transitory effect of the political red herring, for on the Saturday the scent became as cold as a stone. So they were chasing after something. They were drawn after the trail. They made something very sensational, and they were distracted by something. And that's how this phrase begins to enter into our vernacular and our, and our language today, a red herring, with something that distracts or drew someone's attention away. So when I use the phrase red herring, I'm not actually talking about a smoked fish, but using it in this sense of this a metaphor that a red herring is something that distracts from the correct course or from the proper context of something. Therefore, a red herring is something that is misleading. And Brother John, if you, I think that if you pop this definition up there, something that misleads or distracts from a relevant or important question. That's what a red herring is. It's something that distracts you from what is relevant. It's something that distracts from uh, what is uh, what the important question. Now, a red herring can be used in, uh, in literature where someone who's writing something, maybe it's a mystery novel or something that's building some uh, suspense, and so it could be used as a literary device where you're going to lead the reader or the audience to, uh, towards a particular conclusion. So I know it was the butler in the pantry with the candlestick. I just know it. That's all signs point to that. But what the, what the writer has done is kind of signal some things to kind of give you this scent, oh, I think this is what it is, and it leads you to the wrong conclusion. It's a literary device uh, meant to mislead you or cause you to assume things or make the wrong conclusion. But it's also referred to as what is called a, maybe a logical fallacy in debate or philosophy. And it's a red herring can be something that seems plausible, very believable. Oftentimes it's sensational, but ultimately it's irrelevant. And used, it's used to divert your, the attention away from something um, that is uh, the, from the relevant question. My, uh, my children could come to me and they could say, you know, Dad, when, when am I going to get a cell phone? And I could say, well, when I was your age, we didn't have cell phones. And uh, that would be a red herring, right? Because I don't actually answer the question of when am I going to get a cell phone. And I kind of bring up something that's my own personal experience. It's kind of like, well, okay, when you when your age, you didn't have a cell phone. And you couldn't get a cell phone, and the question wasn't relevant then, but now. What about today? Jack wants to know, can you have a cell phone today? And, we don't, and I don't have an answer for that. So I said, when I was your age, I didn't even know what a cell phone was. He hasn't asked. But I, I don't want to mention Elliot today, so I wasn't going to use him as an example. <laughs> but this, there's a lot of different examples kind of, of this red herring. It can be used in very serious debates, uh, debates on gun control, and everyone's always pointing fingers, oh, that's a... You know, it's a logical fallacy. This is a red herring. But it can be true where somebody says, well, you, on the subject of gun control, and you can change it to something else. And say, so, well, let's talk about cars. They kill more people than guns do. And what happens is it distracts from the real issue of discussing, well, maybe there's some points that can be made here. Or let's wrestle with the real meat that's in front of us, the real issue that's in front of us. And so a red herring misleads you from what is important. It distracts from the real question that's at hand. And it can be intentional. Often it's unintentional. But it's, uh, and it's, it's not necessary. There doesn't necessarily need to be the intent to mislead. But what it does do is it does mislead. And a red herring paints the wrong picture. It kind of gives a person the wrong impression. It, 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 you end up placing the wrong kind of emphasis. And um, there's a relevant question. There's something important. There's something happening. And the red herring gets everyone to look away and be like, but what about this stinky fish? 
right? It's something that's used to mislead and distract, and it diverts our attention away from the real issue by focusing it on something maybe sensational, plausible, but in the end it's irrelevant, and it's only on the surface does it seem to be connected. So when I ask the question, uh, or when, no, it's not a question, when I pose red herring or rainbow trout, What I'm asking and what I'm proposing and what we're looking at in this choice, even as it's presented as a menu item, are you distracted or are you focused on the main thing? What is it you're eating on, feeding on? What is it you're focused on? What is it you're thinking about? What it is you're, what is it that you're pondering? Um, are you, are, is it a red herring or is it the main course? Is it the main thing? Is it the rainbow trout? Are we focused on the red herrings associated with the message? And when we talk about red herring arguments, I find most arguments against Christ are usually red herring arguments. They don't want to discuss the actual subject matter or what's being proposed doctrinally or what's being taught. It's all red herring arguments to get you off arguing about things that seem to be re uh, related, but they're really not. They're not relevant, and they're usually sensational. And it's all meant to get you off the trail, to get you off the right path, and to distract you. So the question is, am I caught up? Am I distracted by red herrings, or am I looking at the rainbow trout? Brother Branham in the sermon, what is the attraction on the mountain? He says, so I've got my mind set on this message. That's that third pool, and it's the one that I must be loyal and reverent to. In other words, the third pool is the attraction. It is that, that great, beautiful, it's associated with that great, beautiful rainbow trout. That's, that's what we're interested in. That's what we're desiring to feed on and to find and to explore and to understand better is the third pool. And, and you, can't take, you can't take that to extreme and say, well, then if the third pool began in 1963, then what we're interested in is 63 to 65. And is it pre-63 or post-63? Listen, what we have from 47 to 63 is the foundation upon which that is built. Therefore, it's necessary to be built up in that too. Amen. You can't just try to cold turkey walk into this 1963 and digest it all and get it figured out. There's a ministry a uh, 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 Brother Branham to the Laodicean church age. There was a correction to the Pentecostal church and there was a tremendous amount of restoring that his ministry had to do to bring back that some of the Pentecostal truths that have been lost. And then in 1963, you have an opening up of something that he says, this is beyond Pentecost, but you can't, you can't get beyond unless you get to. So when he says, this is something I've got to set my mind on, that we want to be sure that we're walking in the correct paces of the message of the hour. And it's this third pull, he says, that that's what he must be loyal and reverent to. And that's what we want to watch. Amen. That's what we want to have our attention on is the message. And, and the, the message to Brother Brown, I mean, even that vision, that three-part vision in this particular instance of the fishing, I believe the, the one speaking to him said, don't get your line tangled up in these kinds of times. Don't get, your, don't get a, 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 the, the bird's nest when you're casting. Don't get the backlash. You don't want to get your line tangled up in times like this. This is one you want to be sure that you're setting the hook when you're catching the fish. Don't get your line tangled up in times like this. So be paying attention. Follow instruction. Be mindful of what you're doing. He's saying that's what we want to get. I'll say this. As he says, that's what he's got his mind on. That's what he told us to watch. That's what we want to be doing. Amen. And so realize there's a rainbow trout that we're after. There's a truth that we're after. There's something that we need to be focused on. And the devil would want us to start following after all these red herring. If you wanted to build it a lot on in terms of the fishing analogy... And the, these great fish that they would have caught in John chapter 21, it may have been very well, may have been tilapia, uh, but it, they weren't after the schools of these little anchovies, these little bait fish, the little herring. What God wanted them to catch was these great big fish, 153 fish that filled up these nets. And you could try to chase, chase bait fish all you want and get the anchovies and talk about how important they are and how it's, it, it, it thrive, the ecosystem thrives because of it and, and people feed on it. I'm not saying there's not any benefits to the, red, the, the herring itself. So I hope not to offend, offend anybody whose favorite fish is a herring. But the, the, the idea that what I'm trying to present to you is something that would draw your attention away. Like, oh my, you ever walk up to a body of water in the evening and you see these little these little drops and blops and stuff. And you're like, oh my goodness, there's fish in there. This is amazing. Let's go after it. Well, what you're seeing is like the smallest little thing in the water, either nipping at insects or insects falling. It's like, try all you want, throwing top water, all sorts of lures. You're fishing the wrong thing. 
right? You're distracted by the, the, the things you can see in the blips upon the water. And it's in times like this we want to find the deep things. and We want to get into the real heart of the message of the hour. And Brother Branham says in the sermon, Have not I sent thee? He says, And to see now in this evil day that we live in, when unbelievers and scientists and so forth, so if it's unbelievers, scientists and so forth, brings in everybody else, are trying to cut away the very value of the word. And that's, that's what the devil wants to do, is he wants to devalue the word, cut away at the very value of the word. That's where it starts. I, I feel very confident in saying this, that the slippery slope begins whenever you begin to devalue the word. You don't just wake up one morning and wholesale just reject it all and say there's nothing to it. Something begins to chip away at the value of the word, and it gets to the point where you don't respect it anymore. You don't value it anymore. Therefore, it's really easy just to let it be and walk away from it. And so you recognize that Satan, unbelievers, scientists, the world and society today isn't necessarily going to try to come right out and say, reject it all, there's nothing to it. But everything's working to ultimately devalue the Word of God and cut away its worth for you. And so we do not want the, re the message of the hour to be reduced uh, to a, an anchovy, reduced to a red herring, reduced to something that has very little or no value or benefit to us. We want to recognize it as something that's prized and something that's very valuable. Amen. Unbelievers and scientists are trying to cut away the very value of the word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul writing this about the church in, at Corinth, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I guess I, I'll say this, that right now I think what I want to do is just build the idea of distractions or red herrings or things that mislead in the scripture. So we could kind of place that idea of what a red herring is and how it's used by the devil, and how it's trying to cut away the very value of the word. Paul says, he, as the serpent beguiled Eve, as he deceived her through his subtlety, that, that, that phrase of subtlety is important to remember about his conduct. He says, I fear that as Eve was corrupted, so your mind should be corrupted from what? The simplicity that is in Christ. So what Satan had done is he had defiled their singleness of mind, or he, he was afraid that they would defile their singleness of mind. That is, the, the woman was very, living in a, uh, an Eden, a perfect Eden, with everything laid out for her, every seed bringing forth of its kind, perfection of perfection all around her. All she had to do is obey the Lord. The devil slipped in, and through his subtlety, he complicated things. I, I, and he suggested, that kind of diversionary tactic suggested, well, maybe it's not all that it appears to be, and maybe there's more to it. And so Satan uh, defiled her singleness of mind. Paul was afraid that their, their simplicity and the singleness of mind towards Christ and His Word uh, would be defiled just as the serpent diverted her attention to somebody else, distracted Eve uh, with, with, uh, uh, with a pretense, with something, oh, well, could it be, and something misleading. It's a red herring is exactly what it was. Paul's saying, I'm worried that you'll also be corrupted. And Brother Bram says in God's power to transform in the same pattern he deceived Eve, he has also deceived the church, which there Eve was a type of the church. Notice what it did through the wandering, the wandering for knowledge. She slips across the line between right and wrong by listening to Satan's perversion or deformity of the original word of God. This is always Satan's tactic to confuse the word, to take what the original and, and kind of uh, make it unclear, kind of suggest, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. This is always his tactic. And so he comes in and causes it to wander after something. Well, let me follow this trail. Think about how the red herring was suggested to be used uh, to cause dogs to chase after its scent to train, to train horses, or this little boy is trying to keep the dogs from following after the fox. He uses a, uh, the scent of a red herring. What is, it, what is it expressing to us? This idea that somebody, you should be following something, and now all of a sudden you pick up another scent, and you're chasing that scent, trying to find it. And just as it was written, written in that political magazine, by Saturday the scent is gone. Can we just be honest with one another? Let's go back, uh, well, let's just maybe, let's not but say we did, but let's just think about it for a moment. Go back and look at your text messages over the last few years and find all the prophets doomsaying about the economy, about America, soldiers in the streets, no bread upon the shelves. And think about how so many people have been telling you over and over and over again, you better stockpile this, you better do that, you better do this. And how often it's completely gone and they don't even remember saying it anymore, right? Like, oh, I never told you you need to do that. 
my phone was hacked, right? <laughs> and and what, what, when we look back and we think about what it was in the end, it was, it's all a red herring because something changes, the fear is gone. Oh, it's this, it's that. I mean, I, I'm not saying, I, I'm not necessarily weighing in on it, but I, I, in some of the discussions I've been a part of when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it was like, this is it. This is the end. The great mighty Russia is going to start World War III and it's all going to be over. This great juggernaut of communism is exactly what we thought was going to happen. Here they come. And now what's happening? All right. Everyone's prophesying doom. This is the end. This is the end. This is the end. And what, it, what was it? I think at that point, at least this point, was it a red herring? Because what do we start trying to do? Reinterpret the message, just run a search on communism in Russia and try to figure it all out and place it with dates and blood moons and COVID and everything and try to figure it all out. And instead of really just getting to the heart of the message that brings rapturing faith, we're trying to read the tea leaves of, 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 of modern events. And it's a distraction. And so when Eve was deceived, she specifically says, the serpent beguiled me. I was deceived. I was tricked. And so when, when Paul says, I'm afraid that just as the serpent beguiled Eve, and she confessed to being beguiled, deceived, and misled, Paul says, through his subtlety, he's very shrewd, he's crafty. It means sly or sensible, prudent. So there's a wisdom to what he's trying to say. And, and the devil, if he could just always present himself red with horns and a pitchfork, we could be like, wait a minute. I know what you're about to do, and it's not going to work. Right? But that's not how he presents himself. He presents himself as an angel of light. And he, and he, he says something, and you're kind of like, okay, all right. Let's think about that. That's, that's plausible. That's sensational. That's really, that's getting my political gander up. You know, that's a, this is really good to listen to. And if you find, I think it's, you find it in the, the Christian world today that it's getting so uh, sensationalized to where they're trying to raise up an idea of Christianity and this, this, this Christian identity that Christians are ones that are, that are poised to overthrow the government. And if you think I'm just making it up, I'll play you sermons. I'll play sermons of fundamental, conservative, Bible-thumping, and, and even know of message believers who attended the January 6th insurrection or whatever you want to call it. And, 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 and there's people that are all caught up in this fervor and using the Word of God to justify it. And what is it? It's a red herring. It's a distraction. I say, well, is there nothing to this? Is there nothing? To that? Well, no, it, it, it can be very, very plausible. But what are we told to look at as message believers? And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, on the subject of forgiveness, but yet this principle stands on its own, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Paul instructs the church to do something in light of the fact that Satan wants to take advantage of us through his devices. To take advantage means to defraud you or swindle you. I'm after, the, I'm after the third pull. I'm after the fresh kill of the word of God. I want the message of the hour. I want rapturing faith. And what does he do? He uses a little bit of a red herring to defraud you or swindle you. Oh, I thought this would bring this rapture. I thought this would bring the satisfaction. I thought this was going to be the answer for my family. And he swindles us through his devices. It's a plan or a scheme. Satan uses tactics, these logical fallacies. He uses ad hominins and straw men and all sorts of other uh, logical fallacies and arguments to get us to distract us from the truth of the Word of God. And I'd say that these red herrings, when it comes to the message of the hour, when it comes to our belief as a Christian and what we pursue and what matters and what has the preeminence are more common than we think. Just how often our faith, which should be centered directly on the Word of God, just keeps getting misdirected just a little bit. Can we just all confess, and I'm including myself, just how we wobble a little bit, right? Like this is the path, this is the way, walkie in it, and what happens, we start going, uh, I don't know. But thank God there's a voice that's behind us that says, get back in line, like, thank you, thank you. And then, and then you overcorrect a little bit and say, no, walk this way, yeah, thank you, thank you. And maybe we look back, maybe, maybe by God's grace, getting tighter it's getting tighter it's getting tighter I just want to stay I want to be I'm I'm rising up and what is it that causes the bride and the preview of the bride what does it cause her to get out of step do you remember anybody want to tell me she had her eyes on the church that's descending into darkness Laodicea the Laodicean church and the Laodicean church age 
is descending into darkness, but the bride in her age is stepping up higher, walking to a different music, walking to a different beat. And she's coming on the scene again. She's rising up and she's marching to the, the, the beat of the word of God. And the, when she gets out of step is when she takes her eyes off the word of God that's causing her to raise and begins to look at the other church and what it's doing. That's when she gets out of step. And so we do not want Satan to take advantage of us through his misdirections, through his distractions, through all the diversionary tactics and the devices that he uses to hang us up. Amen. And this could, go, uh, this could go a little bit different direction in terms of how ubiquitous some things are. It's always there. It's always before us. We're always seeing it. We're always hearing it and the channels that he uses to do it. But I want to stay very focused on this idea that there's a goal. There's something we ought to be focused on. There's something we're trying to accomplish and how all these little issues that come up, we need to ask ourselves, wait a minute, how relevant is this? Does it even matter? Is it connected? Is it, 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 it at the end of the day, if we resolve this, if this is, even if it's true, because sometimes we get arguing about something and it's like, oh my goodness gracious, and it's like, well, if it's true, it doesn't change anything. You're like, ah, oh, okay, that was, a, that was a, a waste of energy. I hope you're able to catch what I'm trying to say this morning. In John chapter 21, we've, we read the story of him appearing to them by the sea. And so he's cooked them breakfast of fish and bread. And then Jesus is going to challenge Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, he challenges him those three times. I find it very beautiful that John wrote of Peter's redemption. And Peter was given an opportunity to affirm his love for every time that he denied Christ. The three times denying him, three times of affirmation of his love. And just how it brought out in Peter, Lord, you know all things. Like, in other words, you know everything. Therefore, you know, I love you. And he told him to feed, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And so it's a very, very beautiful story in this. And then he speaks those beautiful words to Peter, uh, how he'll be able to uh, carry thee where you, you'll be carried where you could not go before. And then it says in verse 20, then Peter turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Okay, John, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So John is just, you know, he's humble, right? Um, and he says, and Peter, seeing John, right? Seeing John, and it's interesting, this is just such Peter's nature. He sees John and he knows. I mean, this is the, the beloved disciple. This is the one that whom Jesus loves. And John reminds us two times in his story. You know, the one that Jesus loved. Uh, Peter is concerned about this guy. And he saith to him, Jesus, or he saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? What about this guy? Um, you told me what's going to happen to me, and you kind of given me, told me to feed the sheep, feed the lambs, and you told me that when I was young, I, I girded myself, and I walked where I wanted, but when I get old, and, and I stretch forth my hands, and another's going to gird me. And, and carry me where I could not go. And it's even a reference to Peter's death. And however Peter took it in the moment, maybe he took it as all compliments. And he called him an eagle. And, and he thought it was great. And it was wonderful. But instead of just basking in the glow of the word for him and taking what Christ said to him, I need to feed the lambs, feed the sheep. And I'm gonna, this is what's going to happen. All of a sudden he's like, well, what about this guy? Can I compare? What about your prophecy for him? What, have you, what do you got to say about John? Because I want to compare notes. Can you say, are you going to say the same thing about him? Is mine going to be a little bit different? And he wants to know about John. And Jesus' answer is so beautiful. He says in him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? If I let him never die till I return. If he was, if he was immortal until I came back and John never tastes death, what does it matter what this guy's lot is? What does it matter to you what his calling is? What does it matter to you what I would say to you? I and mean, what's going to be of this guy? Peter's worried about John's uh, position or about his future, his potential. Uh, how will he serve? What will happen to him? And does he love you too? And is he supposed to feed the sheep? Or am I, am I the sole sheep feeder? Am, am I gonna, what's going to happen to John? He's worried about it. And Jesus' answer, I, I, I'm going to put this maybe in a... Uh, an interesting way, but maybe even in Jesus' answer, it's a little bit of a red herring, right? Because he's not, he's not answering the question. 
kind of uses this, this extreme. And so this is Jesus being really, really extreme, right? Sometimes my kids tell me explanations and I don't care if you're 500 feet tall and owned all the gold in the world. We told you to do this. And it's kind of like, 500 feet tall, all the gold in the world. Right? It's like, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm dirt poor. And it's like, that's the whole point. It doesn't matter, right? But Jesus uses the same technique. So I feel so justified in the way that I respond sometimes. He's like, what, is it, what does it matter to you if John never dies? And what does he say? Follow me. What does it matter to you what someone else is doing? Follow thou me. This guy, that guy, you don't know what his calling is. You know what his job is. You don't know what this means for that person. Just follow me. Do what you're supposed to do. I know that we're wired as human beings to kind of follow the crowd. And we're kind of like, oh, there's a crowd over here. Everyone's gathering, right? So what? I don't want to miss out, right? The FOMO. I don't want to, the fear of missing out. I got to be there. What's happening? And you show up and you're standing in the line. It's like, what's going on? What's going on? We're all getting our vaccine shot. Never mind. I'm out of here, <laughs> right? But we're kind of drawn to it. We're like, oh, wow. It's, that's just the way that we're wired. We find comfort in the crowd. We find comfort in knowing that everybody else chooses. That's what we tell ourselves when we eat at McDonald's. Well, can billions be wrong? (laughs) And yet we find they can be. (laughs) But it's this, Jesus is saying, just follow me. Isn't this at the core? If you think about it, Christ is, is there. The fish has been miraculously provided, maybe even miraculously provided on the coals. And Jesus is feeding him. Jesus has just restored Peter and given him such a commission, reaffirmed his position. And there's such a beautiful moment. Think of how personal that time would have been at the seaside with Jesus and his disciples. To me, when you read it and you kind of put yourself in that position, you begin to ponder it. How many am I at now? Who's keeping track? Uh, Three. I've only said it three times. Uh, Ponder that three times. Sha. Four. Can I get a five? <laughs> the, the, it, it's such a beautiful scene. Christ, after they fished all night, and Peter's a little bit disappointed. I'm just going to go fish, and they catch nothing. It's so, such a beautiful scene. And then all of a sudden, Peter's distracted. What about this guy? What about this situation? What about that? What's his, what's his testimony? What's his history? And what's his future going to be? He says, just follow me. And then verse 23, this is when it really gets good. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. You notice how even in that they got distracted? Yet Jesus said not unto him he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So John tries to reaffirm the whole point that Christ was mentioning to begin with. This Everyone latched onto the one part. So was Christ intentionally being misleading? Did he say something sensational so that people would fixate on this idea and try to dissect it and figure out, well, why would he say this? And why would this happen? You know, they do the same thing with the prophet and like, oh, well, you know, he said that, but he didn't really mean that prophets make mistakes because, you know, and they start trying to, to dissect it and figure it out. They can't just say, well, well, all right. Instead of trying to get all bogged down in the semantics of it, what's the message? What was he trying to convey to us? What was, he trying to, what was he trying to say? And instead of trying to think and figure out, well, John's never going to die. What he was saying is, what does it matter if he never died? Follow thou me. What is that to you? What is it to you? What is that to thee was the question. And the answer is, it shouldn't matter. Follow me. So Jesus brings Peter back. He brings his focus back to what matters. Follow thou me. But it's interesting, the nature of mankind as we see it here, it's kind of that red herring where it's kind of like, John, Terry, maybe he never dies. And they start, they get distracted by this doctrine of John's John's immortality. But he says, what is that to thee? And if you think about it in our lives, think about all the questions that are posed on a daily basis, all the different rumors, all the doctrines that we've had to endure. I I thought about this quite a bit uh, in preparation for these meetings in Europe. You have several hundred believers that come, and uh, there's uh, from you know many many different countries from all over. There was like eighty or ninety Russian speaking believers there. Uh, they come from Norway, they come from Latvia, um, Romania, they Hungary. They're just they just gathered from all over. Several hundred believers, and and I started thinking about the difference of when we were there and we ministered three years ago and how they hadn't had that, that the family camp in a couple years, and, and I just began to think of how our situation it changes. 
to where we're never actually in the same context that we were a year ago. Because so much changes and so much evolves and so many things and so many things add up and accumulate. And so we've got to be on guard more than we ever have before. This isn't just the simple 1984 message culture where it's just uh, it, it's just as innocent as it used to be. And maybe some of you can relate more in the 90s. There was a time when it seemed to be like a bubble and it, it seemed to be so harmonious and everything. Yeah, you had your different ideas and you could joke with people. I remember having a friend uh, who was. I uh, wanted to marry a girl whose parents kind of knew about the message and the girl was a message believer. And he said, I just don't know. You know, the parents are kind of against the message. Say, hey, not only that, you're in a cult within a cult. And so, you know, you had some ideas, you know, about different ideas, but there just seemed to be it was a different time. It was a different season. We don't live there anymore. We're living in a different age, a different time, different questions, different ideas, different presses and challenges. And there's so many thoughts and ideas that can absolutely consume us if we'll let it. So many things that consume our thought process that try to bog us down and we try to figure it out and try to the philosophy of certain things and the ethics of certain things and the truth of certain things. And there's so much that we can be so distracted by. And my question is, what is that to thee? What does that matter to you? In other words, don't get distracted. Don't get knocked off the trail. Keep following the scent and the rhythm of the word of God. Follow thou me is the Christ. Keep your eyes on the third pole. Keep your eyes on the word of God. Don't get distracted. Amen. Brother Bram says in the greatest battle ever fought, Matthew 24, also Daniel 12, said there'd be a time of trouble such as never like on the earth before. And we're living in that time when culture and education and things have smothered over the word of God and gone into reasonings and so forth. It's what's happening. It's the Waffle House effect. Smothering over, scattered, covered, and smothered, and dithered, and everything else. It, it, it's what the, the, it's trying to do to the message of there. Smother it over. Cover it up. Get it into reasonings and debates and suppositions and, and, and arguments about certain things. And there's some things that just, it's never going to end. There's some arguments that seem to be, uh, and I respect any man of God who feels the need to address certain things that are taking place. I certainly believe that a, a, a pastor in his pulpit to his people, as long as he even his heart's addressing his local people, uh, they have to be faithful to what they feel. They need to block the people away from. But some, some of the debates that are raging today that I'm aware of or I've been brought into kind of the personal fellowship on, it's, it becomes a, this quote and that quote. And this quote and this quote. And they said, do you see how many quotes we're stacking up? And it's like, look, guys, they believe all that, too. They believe all of that, too. They just believe it differently than you. And we get caught up in things. And there's not, there's not this smoking gun you're going to be able to produce to silence all the skeptics and all the critics. That's something God does in the showdown. But there's something that is our source of strength. That's the target of these things, cut away the very value of the word, smother over the word and get us into reasonings. What draws off into this other mindset. In Isaiah chapter 33, verses five and six, I think this scripture ought to be something that is always ready in our hearts when we're in a difficult moment. The Lord is exalted for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. Beautiful phrase. And in light of that, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation, for the fear of the Lord is his treasure. If I could just summarize that, focus on the word. That's what he's saying. That the wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. When there's things that are taking place and there's so much instability in politics, there's so much instability in social things, there's so much instability in, in, in certain uh, things that we've relied upon. And there's a lot that is unstable right now, whether it be economies and governments, and institutions, there's a lot of instability all around us. And there's a lot of things that could drag us down or dominate our thought process. And whether it be instability related to physical health or instability related to the financial markets or your job. I know there's people whose job situations are changing. And so there's a lot of instability in that. And you're not sure what the future is going to look like. Don't look for stability in, in a stable coin market. Don't look for your stability in the, in the financial markets. Don't look for your stability in anything else other than wisdom and knowledge because that's going to be the stability of your moment. 
and the strength of your salvation. The fear of the Lord is your wealth. It is your treasure. It is your greatest asset. It's what's going to preserve you is the fear of the Lord. If businesses go bankrupt, if the greatest companies in the world are turned out to be nothing more than another Enron, and all of a sudden we don't have Amazon Prime anymore, we, we can't go here and we can't go there. Just think, what would happen if Down East went out of business? And there's a lot of things that might we could really keep ourselves awake at night, but just look back and see what God has done. He's met every challenge. He's, he's satisfied every need. If you've had a want and he didn't want to fill it, he's still yet placated it. And he gave you what you really need. God is faithful. He will take care of us. And wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of our times and the strength of our salvation. That's our greatest asset in times like this. In other words, don't get your line tangled in times like this. You want your line to be straight so you can catch the real thing. So you can have your nets full when it's been dark all night and you haven't caught anything. Don't get your nets tangled up. Don't get your line tangled up in times like these. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. And Brother Bram said, no true believer is any stronger. I love this. Such a, such a heartful. Any stronger and spiritually healthy and alive. So you're not going to be any more healthy, strong, alive than his knowledge of and adherence to the pure word of God. He said, brother, brother Aaron, where, where's my strength? Your knowledge of and obedience to the pure word of God. Every word in that phrase is necessary to understand. It's not, it's, it, you, can't just, you can't leave any one part out. Your knowledge of and adherence to the pure word of God. It's got to be this knowledge of it. So we want to know it. We want to understand it. We want to have it. We want to be, we want to be listening to it. We want to be feeding on it. And then we want to be obeying it. So your strength, your spiritual health, your vitality, your life, your living is connected with your knowledge of the Word of God and your adherence to the Word of God. But what does a red herring do? Cuts you off from your health. Cuts you off from your strength, your spiritual vitality, your spiritual health. It's, that's what causes the instability. When you're walking and you're staying balanced, you're staying in the middle of the road, you're walking where, uh, where the fire has already been, you're standing in the promise of God, and all of a sudden something says, well, we should probably do this, we should probably do this, and you start chasing after this, and you, you depart from what you know, and you start moving this way, and you start going, that's what causes your instability. And Jesus is like, hey, what is that to you? Don't worry about that. Follow thou me. I, I'm, I'm a nervous traveler. Some of you probably know it. And I, if, the, if the flight's at noon, I want to be there at midnight, you know, the noon before. Uh, and I, there's just, this is the way that I am. I want to get there really, really early. And I, I second guess everything. It's like, I know that says right there, this is where baggage claim is, but there's a lot of baggage claims in airports, right? Which one is ours? And if I ever not sure, I stop, Right? be a whole crowd going one way my family everybody and there they go they're disappearing into the mass of people and I'm sitting there going what do we do which way do we go and they're following the crowd right I'm like no I want to be sure if you don't know stop for a moment get your bearings straight recalibrate find where the word is not the crowd not the questions not the sensationalism get back to center readjust recalibrate and get your focus right because our health our strength our vitality, our living, is in our knowledge of the word and our adherence to it. But Jesus, when he gives the parable of the sower, he said the seed is the word of God and it finds place in different ground. But one of the uh, most descriptive passages he uses is that seed that falls into the ground that has other things growing up in it. It's a stage right before the perfect ground and this other vine grows up together with it. And he says this, and the cares, Mark 4, 19, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches cares of this world, the anxiety, the care, the word is through the idea of being distracted. Have you, you notice sometimes when you have something you're supposed to do, but when you're anxious, you end up doing everything else that you, you, you're not supposed to do it, right? I, I joke with my wife, whenever we've got a deadline or we're going on a vacation, we got something we got to get done. I just joke with her. She needs to go find a garage sale, buy, uh, find a dresser or a bookshelf and strip it down and repaint it and sand it and antique it. Because we got a lot we need to do, but this is about that time when you got so much going on, you find yourself completely rearranging your sock drawer. And he's like, hey, you got something you need to do. Like, no, have you ever thought about doing it by height, you know, sock length? Right? And you get you get distracted, right? You get because you're anxious. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. In other words, riches promise a lot to you. 
I, maybe I could get a real hearty amen. How many of you ever taken a job because it offered you more money and you found out that was a lie? <laughs> that was so empty. Right? It did not, it, I thought that was going to be the fix, and it, it's not the fix. Oh, if I can just get a good job, then I can be more faithful with this. If I can just get a better paying job, I'll be more faithful with this. And you find God gives you exactly what you said would be the answer. And probably what needs to happen is it's gut check time. You need to suck it up and start being the believer you know that you're called to be. Amen. Stop making excuses. Stop wait, asking God, to, if you do this, if you'll do that, and start bargaining with God. And you're a son of God. He's going to give you sometimes the things that you ask for, even when he knows it's not the answer, but he does it because he loves you and he doesn't like your anxiety and he wants you to be mentally well and he wants you to be healthy. And so sometimes God is just kind of satisfying us. But if, as we mature, we need to stop and say, wait a minute. No, no, it's not. The answer's not in all these other things. The answer's in the word of God in me just stepping up as a believer and saying, I know this is right. I know this is the truth. I'm going to do what I know I need to do as a believer and stop making excuses. I'm done with my diet of red herring. I want to start eating trout. I guess this is safe for any pescatarian. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in. What? what? Wealth is being described in this. Choke the word, and the word becomes unfruitful. The cares of this world, to this idea of being distracted, it comes from the root to divide, to cut into pieces. And that's what happens with the red herring, is our attention is divided now. You got a job, you got a goal, you got something you're supposed to do, and all of a sudden this scent... Wait, hold, hold on. It's kind of like our kids at a restaurant, right? If there's a screen on the wall, it's kind of like... <laughs> you'll try to sit in the corner, right, where they can't see it, and they'll find them... <laughs> Preston? Yeah? <laughs> eat, eat your food. <laughs> you got you to gotta eat your meal. You got to eat. Focus. But there's a, distra- there's a commercial on, right? Febreze. Yeah, I like this one. This is a good commercial. Ask yourself, what are the red herrings in your life? Are we, is, is there even a consciousness of the distractions from the Word of God? Again, I'll be very, very, very plain to you. I'm burdened as a pastor. I've got to deliver this. Am I thinking of any one particular person in here? No. But you better be making this personal. Because I know this is a burden I've got to deliver. I've got to share. God showed me things and expressed things to me. I know this is important for us to think about and to ponder. Because the question is, do you even know that you're on the sin of a red herring and not the rainbow trout? The rainbow trout represents this pure word that we're feeding on. There is a genuine word that we ought to be focused on. There is a perfection that we ought to be pursuing. And it doesn't relate to the Instagram life. It doesn't relate to the image that we want to portray to people where everything's kind of filtered and everything looks good, whether it be even your, your church. A lot of people want to go to church for all the reasons why people are on Instagram. Right? They want to be part of a circle. They want to be impressing people. They want to have a particular look. They want to have a particular reputation. And, and, and it's, there's a drive within people's hearts where the word is not what matters. There's a perfection that we're to pursue, and it's not social, it's not physical. It's the Word of God. And we cannot, not in times like this, we cannot allow our attention to be grabbed by a red herring. This is something that we got to shake ourselves. Brother, I talked about it a couple times in the seals. You'll catch it if you're wide awake. Wake up, pinch yourself. You know, think about it. Consider the hour that we're living in. Uh, uh, shake yourself. Amen. He even told Life Tabernacle there in Shreveport, run for your life. Wake up, Samson. What's wrong with you? Wait, shake yourself. Where are you at? Got to be careful we don't have the wrong focus where we're so focused on certain things. And into some way, we could say the wrong emphasis. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. These are spices. These are herbs that they tithe on. In other words, they pay tithes on the cumin, like, they're going to measure it out, right? Like, if you're going to make somebody say, oh, no, no, you got to take that, you got to take that herb there, and, um, you know, you got to make sure you tithe it, right? You got to make sure you get it all figured out. And they, they do all these things where they're 
hyper-focused on this one aspect of tithing and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. They're worried about this one side, but they're, they're, they're not exercising justice. They're not demonstrating mercy. They're not, they're not promoting faith. He says, and I love how Jesus says, these ought ye to have done and not leave the other undone. So what was it? An inability to give the proper weight to things. Because he says the weightier matters of the law. There was an inappropriate emphasis on one part, and that's wrong. Maybe there's too much emphasis, but Jesus is saying, don't make the opposite mistake of forgetting all about this and doing the other part. They had the wrong focus. Their attention had been divided. They were so concerned about this, they were leaving others undone. And Jesus says, hey, paying the tithe is not wrong, but you're hyper-focused, you're legalistic, you're so concerned about this part of it, you're forgetting the more important parts. What, what is all this if you don't have justice, if you don't have mercy, if you don't have faith? As I was considering it, pondering it, uh, uh, yesterday, judgment, mercy, and faith, these are the great balancers to the tithing, to the, to the, the, the detailed ways that the Word of God addresses our lives. Without, without judgment, mercy, and faith, without the, right, the justice, the judgment's not just being critical. We might be thinking, well, I got that down. But no, we're talking about judgment is justice, having, having mercy and, and, and doing things that are right. Amen. Having a heart, having a care without judgment, mercy and faith. Whatever we're doing on the other end is out of step. It's out of balance. We're getting heavy on one side and we're, we're leaning too far this way. And we've got to come back and get judgment, mercy and faith to balance us out so that we can be making the progress we need to make. And Brother Branham says in the message, discerning the body of the Lord, because here, here's these priests who are uh, taking out, you know, dividing mint and being so precise and so particular. Well, this, is, this is exactly, well, Brother Branham said this, and this is exactly the way it's got to be, and it's exactly the way it's got to be. And it's kind of like, okay, all right, let's, that's good, I like that. He also said this, well, I mean, I mean, that's just one quote. Well, so is this. Yeah, but... He said that in Brother So-and-So's church, and he had this problem. This guy had an uncle, twice removed, who had a daughter who adopted a kid from Indonesia who had a friend in a school that he went to when he was a foreign exchange student who told him this story, and Brother Ben just kind of had to go down that path to kind of balance something out. And you're kind of like, wait, what? Seriously? I know that seems a little extreme, right? But it's kind of like, what is that to you? The quote meant, the quote was fine here, well, what about the quote here? And I, you don't even, the, the red herring would be trying to debate them both, but just say, hey, what about just taking God at his word? Amen. What about doing both? What about honoring the message? If you honor it here, why not honor it there? There's a power to it. There's a life to it. There's a rationale to it. There's very little. There's things in the message of the hour that I do not understand. There's questions, and probably most questions you'd ask me, I'd be like, wow, that's a good question. I have it too. And you're like, well, answer. I'm like, yeah, yeah, answer would be great. Who do we ask? Right. And, and, and it's just there, there's a lot of questions, but there's some things when I've explored things and got into it. Very rarely do I ever when I come to the answer, I realize there's a wisdom in what Brother Branham taught. There's wisdom in the in the encouragement. There's wisdoms in the standard. And it's not all racism and misogyny and chauvinism and all this. There's wisdom behind it. To glorify God, to keep our hearts clean. And there's a way that we, we try to sully up the message and we chase after all these red herring arguments. Like, God, I know your word is pure. I know your word is true. Lord, help me to understand it. Help me to know it. And don't let me get caught up in trying to be so precise here and completely undone over here. Lord, if I've got to do the one and the other, just help me give the proper emphasis. Amen. Brother Bram says in the message discerning the body of the Lord, uh, this phrase, this first one here, keep, keep this in mind. He says, communism has come in on us. And it has in ways that maybe you don't realize. Because when we think communism, we think of the Cold War, we think the Red Scare. But communism is an ideology that has rebranded itself. Kind of like Avon became the Lone Star Network or something like that, right? It's the same idea, just with a different label. Why? Because everybody's kind of like, yeah, I'm not really big on communism. But this, right? Like, that's good. It's like, have you ever opened the box up? It's the same ingredients, right? Just rebranded. So when, when Brother Man talks about communism, don't just think about Russia. Don't think just China. It's ideology. And he says, communism has come amongst us. World has come in on us. Our churches are broken up. Men dividing themselves, separating themselves. 
Not seemingly to have the faith. Splitting the hairs over the little insignificant doctrines. We should come together arm and heart and pray and fast and call until God sends back the Holy Ghost that we might have spiritual discernment. I thought it was so beautiful how Brother Branham is taking us and, and, and identifying all these different tricks. And he says men are dividing themselves, separating from one another. And he says seemingly not having the faith. So he's referring to a particular scripture, I believe. He says splitting hairs over little insignificant doctrines. And this is, this is part of the red herring and rainbow trout. I think this is where it really opened up to me. Is there's things we start splitting hairs over and we divide ourselves. It's like, that's, that's, that's the dividing line now? This is what's going to separate? And it's like, but what about, the, what about the, the, this truth? This is the word of God. This is what we're taught. This little, this little thing over here, this is a red herring if this is what you're wanting to split, split. If this is the hair you're wanting to split. And Brother Bram says communism has come amongst us. Uh, that totalitarian rule, this authoritarian uh, type of government. And I, I read in an academic article here recently, it was very, very extraordinary the way that it describes these regimes. It says they must create maximum insecurity in the people that they control. And so how do you create maximum insecurity? Through disinformation. This is the whole goal to controlling people in communism is create this insecurity. And so what's the word that's often associated with communistic regimes? Propaganda. But did you know that word actually is started with the Catholic Church? And it's about propagating faith, propagating the doctrine. So it's propaganda is now the dis dissemination of information that's intended to promote a particular view. And so now, nowadays, if we think about it as maybe message believers or not as Americans, we think propaganda, we view it in a negative light. And we say, oh, well, propaganda, you know, that's it's misinformation, it's disinformation. And it typically is. But it's used in such a way to condition the mind to believe certain things are the way they are. These people are bad. These, you can't trust these people. They've done this. They've done that. And you're told it enough, right? This has been scientifically proven through a number of different uh, sociology studies that the more often you hear a myth's truth, the more likely you are to believe that it's actually true. Because you don't ever really dig into it to try to figure it out. It's just you heard it once, you heard it again, and you hear it enough. Your mind just assumes the truth of it. And uh, Brother Andrew, this is where I'm quoting your, the esteemed senator from Virginia. They had a, is in the Intelligence Committee report and the hearings that they had on Russian interference in the 2016 election. And I was reading through things because the phenomena is this, and a lot of us don't realize it, that foreign governments who are, are always been well-versed in propaganda locally, in their own regions, or to cause conflicts and dissuade the control the people in other regions. They now have more tools at their disposal than ever, and they have access to your mind and your thought process through social media, and we don't even realize just how much nonsense we're feeding on that, is the, it, that has been concocted for the purposes of propaganda, whether it's being done domestically or by foreign governments. And the wealth of proof of whether or not you say, well, the Russians manipulated this, or the Russians manipulated they have proof that they were controlling social media accounts to the thousands, saying things that they knew would motivate a particular base of people, and they would believe it, and they would be hot on the trail, right? And they're going to they're gonna do this and do that. And they could pretty much control certain groups of people through propaganda. And Brother Mark Warner said the Russians employed thousands of paid internet trolls and botnets to push out disinformation and fake news at a high volume, focusing this material onto your Twitter and Facebook feeds and flooding our social media with misinformation. This fake news and disinformation was then hyped by the American media, echo chamber, and our own social media networks to reach and potentially influence millions of Americans. Communism is amongst us in ways that we don't realize. Manipulating us in ways that Brother Branham was identifying then. It's causing people to separate, causing people to divide it. It's the red herring that divides us. Why? Because there's one thing that unites us. The word, the rainbow trout. If you want to say you're the rainbow trout, why are we all here? Not because we're smoked herring, right? Not because we're pickled fish. We're here because we were caught by the third pool. We're here because we're rainbow trout. That's what unites us. 
That's what we're gathered around. So then we need to be very careful about the things that begin to divide us and separate us. It's okay for us to have differences of opinions. It's okay for us to have different levels of revelation. I remember my wife, when we were courting, she was like, but, but I don't have as much revelation as you. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> right? It's like, we can be at different levels. It's all right. I mean, I don't want to be debating the Godhead with you necessarily. Right? But he's not one like your finger's one. Well, Brother Ram sitting over here is like, honey, come on. I just want to marry you. So there's things that, yeah, there's going to be different levels, right? We're all in different areas. So, and there may be things that you feel very strongly about. And I would say, feel strong about it. Obey your conscience. Honor the Lord. Do what he asks you to do. But if, you, if it comes to the division, be sure that you're separating yourself under the real word of God and the truth. And you're not letting hair splitting be the issue that divides us. Jesus said, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Amen. Brother Man picked up on this, and what is the attraction? And he says, that's what the attraction is. The predestinated seed of God who can't do nothing else but follow it means more than life to us. Take our lives, but don't you take that. So it's the message of the hour that we've got to be that means more than life to us. That's, that's what the attraction is. What is the attraction? God is usual fulfilling his word. That's what we gather around. We gather around the fulfilled word. And, and, and there's things that even I could say as a church that we are primarily gathered around. We do not have some kind of pet doctrine. We don't have some particular new take on the message. We honor the word that has already been given to us. We stay faithful to the truth that's already been opened up and revealed. There's not another kingdom we're building. We, I believe in this age, there's a reason why Brother Branham introduced the bride age. Because the bride in her age is married to Christ and there's not another. So we don't need another God, another Elohim, another prophet. We don't need another interpretation. We are being wed and married to our Christ. Let's make sure that we have that in common. That's what joins us together. And that there's something that makes you different. That's wonderful. We embrace it. Stay with your conviction. But be very careful that you don't let a red herring separate us. There's certain things you can take and you can have, but don't take this revealed word. Hair splitting, as Brother Bram refers to it, it's something that, uh, that to allow very small distinctions, the hair splitting, small differences become the, 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 the large separation. That's what the hair splitting implies, is that, well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different take. That's splitting the hair. That's a really fine distinction. But, when it, but it's used to refer to something that, wow, that's what divided you? Brother Brandon makes reference to it. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going long today. I mean, I've, I've preached. It's uh, 8 o'clock. <laughs> and G Brother Brandon makes this statement. Every okay right now? Are you, are you good, Brother Joel? I'll just check with you. He's good. I'll keep my eyes on you. Are you good, Cindy? Okay, good. Everybody's all right? Okay, good. If you leave, crawl out so I don't see you. I don't want to get my feelings hurt. I... Brother Brennan makes that statement. He says, men dividing themselves, he says, seemingly not separating themselves, seemingly not having the faith. And to me, he's referring to Jude 19. These be they, and I, I'm glad I didn't put it in there. I had this whole section there, the uh, spots of, in your love feast. He said, these be they who separate themselves, sensual having not the spirit. They, they disjoin. They separate from one another. They make divisions or separations. What Paul, excuse me, what Jude is identifying is this mindset in certain people who kind of prop themselves up and they have these distinctions. Brother Bram says it's hair splitting who don't seem to have the faith. Here it says they don't have the spirit. They're sensual and they come up with some sort of man-made class or some sort of idea of approaching things and they have a carnal way of distinguishing themselves, right? I, I don't have a problem maybe bringing it up with Chris myths, right? There are certain people that have taken the Chris myths and they've used that to separate themselves out and they create the divisions. People who separate, celebrate Christmas and people who don't celebrate Celebrate Christmas. And yeah, th that's maybe some real literal categorizations. But what they do is they say, but the group that does this are the real believers. And that becomes the hair splitting. So well, that's a pretty major topic, Brother Aaron, a Christmas tree. I mean, that's something you should be able to. Christ died on a tree. This is a mountain we should die on. Say, all right, if that's where you're doing it, you just better be sure of it. Because to me, that's one of those little red herrings where we get distracted for 60 days. Uh, I think we started hearing Christmas music after July 4th, though. But there's things that start separating people and dividing people. It's like, hold on, hold on. 
That can mean a lot to somebody. It can mean a whole lot to them. And they can have deep, deep convictions about Christmas and their attitude towards it. And they're very fearful and reverential about that subject. God bless them. I don't want to say a thing against it. But let's be careful that our meat doesn't offend somebody else. If that's your revelation, if that's what you're feeding, let's go back to the message of the hour. Does the prophet draw a line in the sand and say, still, who will stand with me? Who will be shoulder to shoulder with me? Who will stand with me in the word of God and draw their swords against Sinterklaas? Right. Just be sure that you're, you're on the right side of the message of the hour. Because J Jude is referring to people through self-promotion. They, they, they represented that they had a greater sanctity. That they were more spiritual. They had a better wisdom. They had a, a unique doctrine, a different kind of take on things. And that made them distinct from others. So that's what they did is they separated themselves and said, Oh, oh, you don't believe this, or oh, you believe that, or oh, as for us, this is what we do, and this is our conviction. And what they do is they separate themselves. Right. Brother Bram says, and hear ye him, and we're, are we about our Father's business of the Holy Spirit? Getting every soul saved that we can, just on the word, or are we arrogant? This is what he's referring to about these hair splitters. Arrogant and dilatory and arrogant over little religious differences and splitting hairs. Such nonsense. No wonder faith is gone. It's the, the arguing over little differences, hair splitting. He says, that's why faith is gone. It's not because there's not a word that we can feed on. It's because we have a diet of red herring. That's why our breath stinks, right? That, this is all we feed. No wonder. That's why sometimes children don't want to have anything to do with church. It's like, I'm tired of the diet of red herring. They're not built for it. They're not made for it. I believe that there's a lot of situations where people make conclusions about people. I'm like, hold on. Wait a minute. They've never had the right kind of diet to bring out all the gold that's in them. They've never had the right nurture, the right kind of diet, the right kind of atmosphere. Don't judge it yet. No, I don't care how many years it's been. Watch that seed get in the right atmosphere under the right kind of conditions of a loving body of Christ, a faithful minister to the word of God who's promoting right things. Boom, watch them blow up and awesome blossom and be something like, hey, look at this guy. Who knew he had it in him? Why? Don't judge them. They just may have a poor diet. And let us be those who can be espousing the right kind of diet that we can demonstrate, that we can be advocates, that we can have possession and be a stakeholder in this message to say, this is the way. Walk ye in it. What is that to you? Follow the word of God. Anybody remember when I started? Uh, I just, let me. I'll just read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. I think I'll just read this and end. He says, Wherefore, see, and we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. The way, the way that Paul is describing us, just, there's just things that are so easy to us. They're everywhere. They're around us. It's the sin that surrounds us. It's the weight. The weight that doth beset us. And so there's things that are implied here that, e that may be harmless and otherwise useful that can hinder our growth or progress. He says the weight that besets us and the sin that besets us. He makes a division himself of things that just might be distracting you that in themselves are plausible and they're sensational and themselves may not, may not necessarily be sin or evil or some kind of false doctrine. He's saying there's things that don't promote our growth. They beset us. They hinder us. They besetting means it's, it's a weight. It's an encumbrance, a hindrance. So let's lay aside every red herring. Lay aside anything that just so easily triggers us and gets us off track and gets us on the wrong set. And he says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And these beautiful words that I'll close on, looking unto Jesus, Amen. the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. This is the refocusing that kind of gets us back on track. How many here eat sushi? Sister Chris, next picnic. <laughs> Sushi. You don't have to cook anything, right? Hey, here's some rainbow trout, raw. 
Enjoy it. There's a lot of, now I could be wrong because I'm not really a sushi eater. So who's going to, hopefully can help me out here, maybe get some amens. But I love watching an American eat sushi, right? They'll take their California roll, right? They think that's real sushi. And they'll take their roll or their sashimi. They'll take some, something raw. And they take the wasabi and the ginger and they just load it up like a burger with everything and they eat it. Like, man, that was good. It's like, uh, you're using the ginger wrong. The ginger is a palate cleanser that you take between tastings to reset your taste buds so you can enjoy the fish. And Jesus, this is the palate cleanser from Paul. Oh, there's so much out there, so many distractions, so much things full of this and full of that. We need to take, we need to take Christ, cleanse our palates. We need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We need to reset things, refocus. We need to remove that taste of the red herring and recenter on the rainbow trout. So what do you want for lunch? Red herring or rainbow trout? They may have rainbow trout at Papa Doe, but Capitol Grill doesn't have it. Uh, Prime doesn't have They may have a special today, I don't know, but... But I, as for me and my house, I want the trout. As for this church, this church, we don't want to be a red herring church. I, I, I don't want our, our archives to be full of red herrings, right? Right, that on this Thanksgiving, you know, the, all markets are going to fail and Trump's going to be reinstituted as uh, premier of the, the new United States of America and just float that out there for everybody to feed on. And then when, you know, Sunday comes around, it doesn't happen. It's like, well, I never claimed to be a prophet. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 1, right? And everybody's kind of like, wait, is he ever going to talk about this thing that he went on forever about? Let's not be that group. Let's not be those people. We've got a perfect message, a pure message. So what we want to do is look unto Jesus. Maybe we'll just pick up on some of these things Wednesday night. We'll look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Amen. Could we stand together today?